right. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all here. My name is Jeff Shaman. I am the interim dean of the Columbia Climate School. And welcome to one of our signature speaker series, which aims to bring in great minds to talk about uh, interesting work that they'll share with our community here. Delighted that we're having this. Let me just give you a little rundown on the format. We will have a presentation and talk, followed by a little bit of Q&A as time allows, and then there will be a reception outside on this floor. So please join us there. So pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kate Calvin. Uh, Dr. Calvin was appointed NASA's Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor to Administrator Bill Nelson on January 10th, 2022. She advises NASA leadership on the agency's science programs and science-related strategic planning and investments, and provides recommendations for the agency's climate-related science, technology, and infrastructure programs. Since 2008, Dr. Calvin has been an earth scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory's Joint Global Change Research Institute, which is based in College Park, Maryland. The works there are on global change analysis modeling, a system, or she works on the global change analysis model, which is a system for exploring and analyzing the relationships between human and earth systems in the context of global climate change. She's also worked on the Department of Energy's Energy Exascale Earth System Model, a system for analyzing the past, present, and future state of the Earth system. Uh, her research simulates the interaction between global resources, focusing on the impact of land, water, and energy use through an environmental and socioeconomic lens. Her recent work has investigated growing populations and their effects on agriculture and water scarcity and the interactions of them in the face of climate change. In addition, she's contributed to IPCC assessment reports and is working on the current assessment report, as well as the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Dr. Calvin received her doctorate in management science and engineering from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree, uh, bachelor's of science in computer science and mathematics from the University of Maryland. With that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Calvin, who will talk to us today about space, aeronautics, and climate. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here and to be able to talk to you a little bit about what we are doing at NASA. Sorry, I'm just getting some water ready just in case. Um, and as I mentioned, we're gonna, I'm going to talk today about space, aeronautics, and climate, but not necessarily in that order. I'm going to move my way around all three um, and share a little bit about what we do and how we think about both our planet as well as exploring other planets. I want to start with this image, which might look familiar to many of you. This has been, is called Earthrise. It's a picture of the Earth that was taken on the Apollo 8 mission on Christmas Eve, 1968, by an astronaut named Bill Anders. So the Apollo 8 mission was the first crewed mission to orbit the moon. And as they were orbiting the moon and coming around the backside, they looked out the window and this is what they saw. And this is the first color image of Earth from space. Um, and I had the opportunity about a year ago to talk to the astronaut that took this photo um, and talk about the experience of seeing Earth from space and what this photo has meant to him since then. And what you hear from him um, is, is about how, you know, how beautiful Earth is and how delicate it is and how important it is to protect Earth. And you hear this from all of astronauts. Um, it's called the overview effect. When you see Earth from above, um, you think about it differently and you think about protecting it differently. And one of the other things that Bill Anders said is, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is that we discovered Earth. And we have been discovering Earth ever since. Um, and even as we think about exploring the moon again, we're also thinking about Earth. So it's more than 55 years from now. So that photo was taken as part of the Apollo era. Um, so it was Apollo 8. Um, and we're now in what we're calling the Artemis era. So we are planning to go back to the moon. You might have read about some of that in the newspaper. So I'll give a little quick overview now um, of, of what's different between when we went before and we went again. Um, so, we, you know, when we went to, for Apollo, the primary driver was to get there fast within the decade um, and to be the first to touch the surface of the moon. Science wasn't really at the forefront. It was kind of an afterthought. But they brought a lot of rocks from the surface of the moon back while they were there. 
And we have learned so much from those rocks ever since and are continuing to learn from them. So we learned, you know, those rocks and samples changed our understanding of the earth moon system and how the moon was formed. Um, and because we've kept quite a bit of that sample um, for future generations, we can use new technologies to keep looking at those samples and better understanding what we knew about the moon. Now, when we're going for Artemis, the goal is science. Um, so we want a steady cadence of missions so we can do long-term scientific discovery. So it's changing that direction. So we're thinking about science first. We're thinking about what is the science where you actually need people as compared to just observing remotely or sending robotics. We're going to a different part of the moon, the South Pole, where you have some of these, um, we can collect some older lunar samples and extend the record of our solar system back and teach us more about Earth and our own solar system as a whole. Um, and we're also thinking about if you're doing science like this, you might need to stay longer. And that has some implications on how we go um, and that those also have benefits here on Earth. So I will do a little bit more on Artemis science um, towards the end, but I actually wanna talk about one of our most important missions, and that is our home planet. So while we are continuing to explore outer space um, and we're planning to go back to the moon, we also spend a lot of time studying Earth and making sure people know how it's changing. So what you're looking at right now is um, annual temperature or monthly temperatures and each line is a different year and it's showing the change in temperature over time. And as you see, it's gradually working its way up as the Earth is getting hotter. And it's gonna get less gradual and hotter as we get closer to today. And when you look at 2023, it was far and away the hottest year on record. Um, and there are many in the second half of the year, um, all of those months are warmer than what we've seen before. So 2023 was the hottest year on record. Collectively, the last 10 years have been the warmest since, since modern record keeping began. It's not just temperatures that are rising. With these rising temperatures, we're also seeing impacts on people and ecosystems all around the world. Um, so we're seeing changes in the water cycle. We're seeing changes in extreme events, declines in Arctic sea ice, declines in um, melting of ice sheets, sea level rise, all of which have impacts on people. We know um, what's driving the climate change we're experiencing. We know that rise in greenhouse gases are driving a lot of this warming. We also know that many of these impacts will increase with future warming. And so part of what I wanna do today is talk a little bit about how we study Earth and climate um, and then come back to some of the rest of our science here. So I'm gonna start just doing a little bit more on impacts. Um, so this is um, a visualization of Hurricane Idalia um, which um, is the one over Florida right now. There's another hurricane out in the ocean. Um, but this is an, a visualization using satellite information of precipitation. Um, Hurricane Adalia struck in August of 2023. Um, and what we can do is look at these hurricanes and look at the precipitation, how much is falling, where it is in that structure. Um, and what we're seeing when we look, not just at our satellite records, but at all the records we have of hurricanes, is that we're seeing a higher proportion of strong storms as climate changes. So we're seeing more, more of the storms are category three through five, so a higher proportion of those. We're also seeing more precipitation associated with this. So we're getting more rainfall in there. And this is having impacts um, throughout the, the tropics um, uh, as you, these storms um, are, ch are changing and we're uh, encountering people and infrastructure and profit property all around the world. So hurricanes are just one of the impacts. We're also seeing changes in the water cycle in general. And so what we end up seeing is um, more heavy precipitation events and also in some regions, more drought. So what you're looking at here are, is a visualization of um, extremes in the water cycle. So the, the size of the bubble is giving you a sense of how large the extreme is. Blues are, um, are wet events, reds are dry events. Um, and this is all using um, information from a, a, a satellite or a satellite called GRACE and GRACE follow-on. So there are a pair of satellites um, that can measure changes in, um, in mass. So when they fly over a part of the earth, they can measure the change in the mass. And from that, you can see essentially where water moves. You can see when your ice sheet melts and goes into the ocean. On land, you can see where there's more water stored underneath the land or in the surface of the land. And so that's how we can use this to understand where we have more water or less water and how that's changing over time. So GRACE, the, the first version of it launched in 2002. So we have more than 20 years of this information. And so we can actually look at it over time 
um, and see how that's changing. Um, and you know, the animation was showing you the, the, the individual spots um, as they changed over time. But what you can see in the bottom is on the left is global temperature. So that's a version of that same animation I showed you before. We're seeing rises in global temperature. But then there's also an index of the intensity of these water extremes on the right. Um, and this index is, is capturing the duration, the extent, um, and the, the intensity of those events. And what you see is that they're increasing over time because climate change is changing our water cycle so that we do have more extreme events in this, uh, more extreme wet and dry events over time. Another one I, that, that I wanna talk about is wildfire. And this is an animation of uh, carbon mi uh, monoxide from wildfires. Um, and I think, you know, everyone here, you live in New York, you were probably here last summer when the wildfire smoke came down over Manhattan and turned the sky orange. Um, and that was wildfire smoke coming from fires in, in, in Canada. Um, and there are elements of wildfires that are linked to climate change. So climate change is driving more an increase in fuel for fire. So in those places that get dry, that means the vegetation always dr also dries out and you have more fuel that could turn um, be used in a fire. We're also seeing changes in um, fire weather that are associated with climate change. So fire weather is when it's hot, dry, and windy. So if it's hot and dry, you know, you, it's and, and you have dry vegetation, then you can get an ignition. And then if it's windy, that blows, and then that wildfire can spread. Um, and we are seeing increases in wildfire as a result of this. Um, and we're also seeing, you know, those smoke patterns are starting to go into places where we didn't have before. And we have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of health impacts associated with wildfire smoke. I think it was a little, it was, the wildfire smoke was more intense in Manhattan than where I live in DC. But even in DC, you, it, it was difficult to breathe outside in a few of those days. And you actually had to think about, can I do this activity outside given the air quality? And so it's something we wanna think about here. This particular um, visualization is actually from a model where we took some observations and looked at them in a, in a physical model where we could um, add in more information and track that wildfire smoke um, around, um, around the country. So I've mentioned a little bit about um, hinting at how we study um, the Earth, but one of the primary ways we study the Earth is through our satellite fleet. Hopefully this is going to work. There we go. Um, and this is just a visualization of our current Earth observing fleet. Um, and we actually, it's from January 31st, so it's missing our most recent satellite, but I will talk about that. Um, and it is, um, so we have more than two dozen satellites and instruments in orbit. Um, including several on the International Space Station that are continually monitoring our planet. So we can see things like vegetation, clouds and precipitation, carbon dioxide, and much more. And each of these satellites and instruments is designed to study something different. So that, that design includes both the instrument that it's on, um, so what it's measuring, what it's designed to measure, the orbit it's in. So we, um, we have some satellites uh, it's harder to see in this one, but we have some satellites that are that are orbiting the entire globe. We have some that stay above a particular point. We have some, you know, the International Space Station doesn't do the poles, but we can design where it flies over, what it measures, um, and that can tell us something different about the, the, the planet and how it's changing. Um, and how the planet's changing is one of the important things that we can look at. And so I'll give one example. So I mentioned, you know, in when I was talking about Apollo 8, that was in 1968. Um, and, you know, we've been looking at Earth since. Starting in 1972, we had a satellite series called Landsat, where we were actually measuring land use and land cover from space. Um, and since the first version of this was launched in 1972, and we've maintained this as a continuous record, we have more than 50 years now of looking at land use and land cover change. And so what these, this can show us, it can show you where there's vegetation, where are there trees, where are there crops, where are there urban areas, um, where are there lakes. Um, and what you're actually looking at right here is Las Vegas um, and the surrounding region. Um, but by looking at this, since you can look through 50 years of this, we can see how that's changed. So in Las Vegas, what you saw, and I can try to play it again. Um, in Las Vegas, what you'll see is the city is going to get bigger. We see that in a lot of our cities around the world. Um, so our cities are getting larger. There's an urbanization trend. Um, you also see the change in this lake here. Um, that lake starts to shrink over time. 
Um, and when you look at other parts of the world, you'll see things like deforestation in some parts of the world. There are some parts of the world where we're seeing reforestations. We're actually getting more tree cover. But you can see changes in lake size, changes in snow cover. Um, and we can look at all of that and try to understand um, how the Earth's changing. And then when we combine this with other data sets or models, we can understand the drivers of those changes and the impacts of those changes. So this is one of our continual records, um, and we do have several of these types of satellites and measurements that we have measured for decades. So I mentioned earlier, um, GRACE and GRACE follow-on, where we have 20 years of data on changes in mass. We have 30 years of data on sea level rise. But in addition to these continuous records, we're also continuing to innovate and learn um, what is the next observation we need, what else do we need to study, and how can we measure that from space? And so I wanna talk about our newest satellite now. Um, so our newest satellite is called PACE. It launched in early February um, and it will have first light um, reasonably soon. Um, and what PACE is studying is tiny things, both in the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, so in the ocean, it's gonna be able to tell us more about plankton. Um, and plankton, you know, the base of the food chain. So they're the, the start of the food chain that they're eaten um, and go up towards fisheries. Um, plankton, if there are certain types of plankton are also toxic and they can lead to harmful algal blooms. And what PACE will do is give us more understanding of the types um, of phytoplankton. So before we could kind of see where, the, where those were, but not the types because we didn't have a fine enough measurement of the color. Um, what PACE is doing is giving us a better understanding of the color of what's in the surface of the ocean. And we can use to, that to understand what it is and then use that information to predict what might happen. Whether that's you know using it in fisheries models, using it to predict harmful algal blooms. So there are some people that wanna look at if we know a harmful algal bloom is, is coming, you can harvest your oysters sooner so that they don't end up under the harmful algal bloom. Um, that's the ocean side of PACE. Um, and I see a lot of atmospheric scientists in the room. So I have to also mention the part of PACE that's looking at the atmosphere. So it's also got going to study tiny things in the atmosphere. And so we'll have a better understanding of aerosols. Um, and aerosols have impacts on, on cloud formation. They have impacts on climate because they can either re reflect or absorb sunlight. Um, and they have impacts on air quality, things like wildfire smoke that I showed before. Those are you know, particulates um, and aerosols. And what PACE is gonna be able to do is give us a better understanding of those so that we can better, we can better model that, we can better represent that, we can better understand um, what's happening in our atmosphere. So that was our most recent satellite. I wanna go back, we have an, another satellite that launched um, about a year ago next week, I think, called Tempo. This is one of those I mentioned that different satellites have different orbits. This is one that just stays over North America. So it can't see the rest of the world, but the upside to seeing over North America is it can make really, really frequent measurements. And what it's measuring is air pollution. So this is looking at nitrogen dioxide. Um, and what you can see here when you, and particularly it's hard on the big screen, but when you zoom in, you can see where this, um, where this nitrogen dioxide comes from and how it changes throughout the course of a day. Um, and it's doing this at sort of a neighborhood scale. Um, and what you can see um, when you zoom in around New York, you can actually see rush hour on the highways. So you'll, you'll see more pollution along 95 during the rush hour in the beginning and the end of the day, and more in New York City proper um, during the workday because people come into New York and they turn on things in New York and then they leave New York and you can measure all of that. And what, because we have this frequent measurement and it's neighborhood scale. And some of what they want to do with that is, first of all, just understand the drivers, but they're also looking into, can we, you know, define, you know, help with alerts. So air quality causes a lot of health impacts, particularly for people with asthma. And so can we use this information to help people understand when there is an air quality per, um, problem and, and recognize that. Um, but you can look through and actually see these changes throughout the course of the day. So that is Tempo. It is one of our newer satellites from about a year ago. Um, I now want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, I talked about satellites. One of the other things we do is modeling. Um, and there's different ways you can use models and there's different types of models. I'm not gonna do a full modeling presentation though, as you heard in my bio, that's actually my background. So happy to answer questions about that. Um, but I wanna talk about one of the ways we can use a model is to take ob observational data and fill in more information. So we have these observations, they have at different spatial scales, different variables that we can measure, different frequencies, and then you might want a complete picture of what's happening on Earth. And so we can use a model for that. And the example I'm actually gonna show is a different type of emission than the one we just looked at. It's on greenhouse gas emissions. 
So these are animations of carbon dioxide and methane that are using, um, they're, they're, found, they're, they're produced by merging observational estimates in the, in the case of carbon dioxide from one of our satellites that measures carbon dioxide from space into a model. Um, and then we can actually look at where does carbon dioxide come from over the course of a year. And so that's on the left is carbon dioxide, on the right is methane. Um, and when you compare the two, what you'll see is they have different sources, both in terms of place. And then with some of this work, we can also differentiate based on what, what it's coming from. Is it agriculture? Is it fossil fuel um, and, and in industrial emissions? And they have different sources there over time, over space, um, and over um, direct process. Uh, and so that's what we can look at from these models. This is just one year. So we're currently in June. It's going to work its way through December. And you will see some seasonal cycles, both on uh, sort of human activity. So if you think about in, in a, a, a location like this, you might see, you know, or in northern uh, regions, you might see more emissions in the winter as you turn on your heat. Um, in some of the tropics, you might see more um, in the summer as you turn on your air conditioning. Again, it depends a bit on how you produce your um, electricity. But there's also different natural processes that happen. So with carbon dioxide, what we'll often see in carbon dioxide concentrations is it will, it, it will um, be slightly lower in northern hemisphere summer than it is in northern hemisphere winter because the trees and all the plants um, take some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So this is just a year. Um, if you were to look at this type of information over time, you would see a continual increase in, car, um, in greenhouse gases, and that's one of our drivers of climate change. We can take that information and estimate emissions, and as I mentioned, we can estimate it by different types of things. So this is using that kind of information and looking at annual emissions, um, fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions by country. Um, and so you can see where some of the big sources of carbon dioxide emissions by country are. This is just an annual snapshot. Um, so it's an average of uh, between 2015 and 2020. Um, if you looked at something like this over time, you would see total global CO2 emissions have been rising, but where they're rising and where they're falling is different. So there are countries that have had declines in carbon dioxide emissions in recent years um, and others that have had increases. So one of the other, you know, we, we can look at this sort of from a, a spatial scale, we can estimate annual emissions, we can look at it monthly, but one of the other questions is often, where is it coming from and what can we see from space? Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about an innovation. Um, this is um, an image of a methane plume. Um, and this is from an instrument on the International Space Station called EMET. EMET was designed to measure mineral dust. Um, so mineral dust are these fine particles that either reflect or absorb sunlight depending on their color. And we don't have a good understanding of the total distribution of mineral dust around the globe. Um, we have some measurements, particularly around certain types of the, um, the planet, but we don't have a comprehensive data set. So EMET was designed to help us with that. So we can better constrain mineral dust and its effect on climate and air quality. What the science team realized is that in addition to measuring mineral dust, the type of instrument it was could also identify methane super emitters. Um, and so this is an example of one of those um, where it's identified a methane super emitter. And some of these super emitters, uh, methane, they're, they're leaks from, you know, from pipelines or oil and gas wells. And the people that, that, uh, that, that people want to know that because that's you know, they don't, that's a product for them. And so we've been putting this data out publicly so people can see what's happening around the world. So we can see this from space, we can make it publicly available and let people use it however they see fit in there. Um, and so that's one of the new innovations we have is taking the same one instrument that we have and looking at it to measure something else. So that's a little bit about earth science and how we think about observing climate, a little bit about how we model but one of the other things we do, I was going to talk about aeronautics. So the first A in NASA is aeronautics, um, and we do a lot of aviation research. And a lot of the research we do on aviation is actually about reducing energy use and emissions in aircraft. So we've worked with the aviation use industry for decades um, to reduce the environmental impact of flying. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that and give a few examples there. Um, and this is part of, you know, in addition to doing research on climate, NASA also develops technologies that can help us respond to climate. And this is one example. I'll mention a few um, later, um, very briefly. But in the aeronautics, because we are the aviation research agency for the United States, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how you use planes um, and how to do that in a way that reduces energy and emissions. 
So we've been doing this for decades. Um, and some of the examples you'll see, if you're on a plane next, and you can see it in this picture looking out the window here, you'll notice that the wings of your plane curve up at the end. Uh, that reduces drag, which means you use less energy, which means less emissions. And that came from NASA research. One of the other things they've been looking at, it's not just um, the plane itself, they've also been thinking about airport operations a lot. And so working with um, airports and FAA to think about, could you do that differently? And so they had a project looking at, could you optimally time when you start to taxi? Um, so when you back away from the gate and start to taxi, because that's the moment when you turn on the engine. Um, so once you start doing that, you're starting to use um, energy and generate emissions. And so they had a whole project about optimally timing that. And what it meant was that you ended up, you could time it in a way that you spend less time waiting on the tarmac. So then you use less energy and create less emissions. You also spend less time on the tarmac. And so there's a, there's a benefit to this just in general. Um, and so they've been working on that. How can we better optimize you know, the, the plane itself the, um, the airport operations, and then also looking some into alternative fuels. So they've done some research on electric aircraft um, and other alternative fuels there. One of the things we're also working on now, I mentioned the plane itself. So the wings curving up was a past research. We're working now on wings again. Um, so we have just um, announced, a, 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 this is called the X-66 concept. Um, it's part of the Sustainable Flight National Partnership, where we work directly with, with the industry um, to figure out how to change a plane to make it, um, to, you know, again, more energy efficient. Um, and this is work we're doing with Boeing to build, test, and fly a demonstrator. And the goal of this is to reduce energy use by 30% by 2030 from this. And so we'll work on building that and it's um, targeting single aisle aircraft. Um, but it's really around the wing design. So you can see these wings look different than the ones you're used to. Um, and again, the idea there is about reducing drag. Um, so that's a little bit on how we, aeronautics has been working to reduce energy and emissions. One of the other things they do is start to think about how can we use what we know about aviation and airspace and airspace operations to help um, in the response to climate or climate linked events or natural disasters in general. So not just climate, um, but general natural disasters. And so this is um, just some images here from a, a project we have called Acero, where they're using drones and advanced aviation communications to help improve wildland fire management. Um, so one of the ways we, um, we fight fires, um, particularly out west, is we fly planes over them and drop fire retardant. That's how you suppress a fire. Um, the problem with the, the way we do that now is my, the way they fly those planes, it's using what's called visible flight conditions. So you have someone, an air boss, that's directing traffic, and he has to be able to see what's happening, um, which means they can only do this. Um, they, they can't do this at night, and they can't do it when it's smoky because they have to be able to see. Um, and people have thought about, you know, can you use drones in that way? But you have to carefully manage your airspace that you don't have you know, you know where everything is and how it's working. And so we had a lot of workshops with the fire fighting community, with other US government agencies, with scientists to sort of think about where are those challenges and what can we do to help? Um, and some of what they've come up with is sort of how do you use drones for observations, for, um, for other sorts of firefighting uh, mechanisms. And then the other one that came up a lot was communications. Um, and, and it turns out NASA has quite a bit of research in how to communicate because we have to communicate with things like spacecraft that, that are far away. Um, so we know how to do a lot there. And so they're also thinking about how can we use some of our comms to help make sure that everyone on the ground that's involved um, can get the information they need when they need it. And so we're working now with those communities um, on, yeah, on both drones and communications to help there. So that was my aeronautics piece. And I did mention at the beginning, so we talked a little bit about climate, talked a little about aeronautics. And I, I mentioned at the beginning um, Artemis and, the, and exploring the moon. I do want to just in my last um, five or 10 minutes come back to that um, just to talk about it. Because again, you will see a lot about that and NASA is continuing to explore. And I want to make sure everyone understands how we've been really thinking about that. Um, so part of what we're doing, we have um, a blueprint for how we explore space. And one of the big things at NASA is really thinking about the benefit for all. So how can what we do benefit people here on Earth, regardless of what, um, what they're doing? And so we've worked through a strategy here. And so what we're trying to do is establish this long-term presence at the moon for scientific exploration um, with partners, learn how to live and work away from home, and prepare for other scientific exploration, um, like towards Mars. Um, what we learn at the moon 
from the history of our solar system is going to help us better understand our solar system and better understand what we might find as we continue to explore. Um, and I'm going to come back again to this learn how to live and work away from home, because that's something that actually has quite a bit of benefit for us at home. Um, but we can go through the, some of the science here. Um, what you'll see in the science, this um, slide is going to, the words on it, I won't read through all of them, but they're going to look a whole lot like the overall strategy, because the part of the goal of Artemis is science. And so when we think about what our overall strategy is, we're also thinking about what are our science goals. Um, and so this is a, a, the moon is a really interesting destination for scientific discovery. And the goal here is really to explore more of it than we ever have before. We wanna study and sample the lunar environment, um, better understand our solar system. Um, and through everything we wanna do, we wanna understand, you know, better prepare to live and work in deep space. And so some of the science we've done about in 2022, we had the first Artemis mission and it was uncrewed and it just orbited the moon, but there was a lot of science on it anyway. And a lot of that science was really designed on understanding radiation and its effects on crew, electronics and biology. So I'll just give a few examples here. Um, we had a, a bunch of vests that were measuring radiation so we could understand the radiation environment. We had some um, space biology experiments where we had fungi and seeds, algae, um, and um, and yeast in the um, in the Orion the, in the spacecraft itself. So we could look at how does radiation affect those biological systems. We had a, a bunch of cubesats on there. One of them, the one shown here, had yeast on it again to try to understand how radiation affects um, the the environment. And for us, you know, it's about you know, Artemis itself, so it's about how we explore, but it's also in this thinking about how it affects people here on Earth, we also can look at a lot of that in research, goes into medical research, th towards things like cancer treatments. Um, and this is not my area, but we're involved in the Cancer Moonshot because we've done a lot of research on radiation um, and other things that you can do in outer space about medicine. So trying to think about how can what we do there benefit here. The next mission, Artemis II, uh, is going to send people back around the moon. So it'll be the first um, humans to set eyes on the um, on the far side of the moon and on Earth from space from that distance of space in more than 50 years. So this is the equivalent to that um, Earthrise photo I, I showed you in the beginning. That mission. This is the equivalent of it um, in terms of that it's crewed and it's and it's orbiting the moon. What's different here, though? is that the trajectory is a bit different. So we'll be able to see more of the moon. Um, there will be a lot of science on board, but we're again trying to document through photos and recordings what the human experience is there and try to think about just like when we talked to Bill Anders about his experience of seeing Earth from far away, what does that mean? And can we use that to help people understand what Earth looks like in addition to doing this science that's focused on the moon? Um, some of the things that we will be doing science-wise, again, focused a lot on sort of understanding um, radiation and distance from home um, and what that means for health. So looking, they'll be wearing watches that'll monitor their sleep-wake patterns. There'll be radiation experiments. They'll look at saliva to understand the effect on the immune system. And so we'll be able to do all of that in this one. As we move farther into Artemis, we actually get back into Earth science. Um, so I want to take us back to Earth, where um, I started. And I met with a bunch of professors here earlier today, and some of them were talking about sort of, you know, Earth's history, its geological history, its climate history, um, and what's happened. And we're kind of limited in some of the things that we can measure on Earth because atmosphere and the presence of humans have changed our planet. Um, but one of the nice things about a place like the moon is those things aren't quite the same. And so we have a longer history that we can record. And so some of the goals around going back to the moon are to help us understand the geological history of Earth. Um, and so just some of those highlights, you know, the moon has recorded this history of Earth. What, what these, um, the astronauts, when they step on the surface, um, because we're going to a different part of the moon, they'll be stepping on a surface older than anything that they could experience here on Earth. And we can, you know, we'll have 4 billion years of information about the processes that affected the moon, which were also processes that were affecting Earth. And so we'll be able to, to capture that geological history. They'll be able to drill cores just like we do with ice cores here or tree rings and capture some of that history. So we'll be able to look at Earth. So it's kind of in the same sense that Bill Anders said, you know, we went all this way to discover the moon and the most important thing is we discovered Earth. We are still thinking about Earth as we explore, both in terms of science, but also in terms of technology. And so I mentioned a bit earlier that, you know, we're learning to live and work um, away from Earth. 
a lot of the things you need to do to live and work away from Earth have benefits for us right here on Earth. Um, and we have some of those examples already just with the International Space Station, but we're thinking about how much more do we need and how can that help us here as we're going further away. So just in terms of the International Space Station, they've done a lot of work on growing crops um, in the International Space Station. And that has led to improvements in lighting and indoor agricultural facilities on Earth, improvements in fertilizer. Um, you know, they've also had to think about water and how do you get clean water to astronauts when you can't always bring it with you. And that means better water filters that are now used on Earth and parts of the um, of planet that don't have access to clean water. And so then when we're thinking about going beyond, um, some of the things we're thinking about, they've been doing a lot of prizes and challenges. Some of them are around energy resilience and energy storage. So how do you ensure you have a, a, a reliable energy source um, where you are? On, you know, on a lot of our satellites and missions, we have solar panels, but what if you're in a place that's dark? that could have benefits here um, as we're thinking about energy resilience and storage here. Um, they're also thinking a lot more about food. So as we're exploring, we're continuing to think about Earth. And then we also have as one of our most important missions, the planet itself, and we're doing a lot of observations and modeling to help us understand how it's changed over time and how it might change in the future. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions. Uh, people from the audience, we're gonna go up to you with some microphones to ask you to ask the questions here. Your hand up here. You, you want to take it. Yeah, um, so contrail clouds, cirrus clouds have been known to trap heat in the earth from airplane exhaust. You know, most people know that. Has NASA made any headway in far as, you know, reminiscing data around this, such, you know, latitudinal danger, longitudinal data. You know, the Earth is a big place. Have NASA and their partners made any headway as far as, you know, coalescing and getting this data together and making sense to the general public? Yeah, and so just um, to start on this, when, you know, as planes fly, there's, um, you know, that can and induce cloudiness and there's contrails that come out from behind them and they do have a short-term climate impact. We actually have an ongoing National Academy study on this. Um, so looking at what do we know about aviation um, and its short-term climate impacts from things like contrails and aviation-induced cloudiness. So there's an ongoing National Academies of Science study on that sp very specific topic. Thank you. I'd like to hear more about how you transfer the science developed at NASA into diplomacy. I know you worked with the IPCC, so I'd love to hear more. Yeah, great. So I will give a couple of different examples. Um, since you mentioned IPCC, I will start there. So I was, um, I'm actually the co-chair of one of the IPCC working groups. And a lot of NASA scientists also contribute to the IPCC either as authors um, or having their literature reviewed. And it's a, you know, it's a big international effort to understand and assess climate change. Um, and a lot of the NASA scientists do contribute. Um, and again, as my role as co-chair, I'm trying to facilitate the overall process for the working group focused on climate mitigation. That's one element of our sort of international engagement. We also have a number of projects um, in, uh, around the world. Some of them, we have a project called GLOBE, um, where it's really about sort of citizen science and engagement of local communities. And so you, they have like an app on your phone where you can take pictures of clouds or, you know, or do things like that that can help um, us you know, with our science, but also engage the local community. And then we also have a project called Servere that's joint with USAID. And there we're working with local partners to help them figure out how to use satellite data to help the needs that they have on the ground. So things like how do you find water, like pastoralists find water in Eastern Africa. Um, and so trying to figure out how can we take the satellite information we have and work with those local partners um, to use it for needs that they have. Uh, given the abundance of data that we have, uh, still why can't the government agencies able to predict whether as accurately as they should be especially in terms of creating resilience of communities, climate resilience. Like we have so much data available on so many aspects of the weather, but still the prediction is not that accurate. 
Yeah, so I think a couple of things on that. So first of all, when you talk about data, you know, we have a observational data. Um, every time we learn something new from the observational record, we figure out what we know and then refine the question about what we still need. Um, and so PACE is one where, you know, we still had questions about aerosols and how they affect clouds um, and, you know, what we can measure there. And that's going to help us be better at prediction in the future, both for weather and for climate. So that's on the observational side. And again, we're, we're continuing to learn and improve and realize what, we, what observations we still need. On the modeling side, I think we are better at predicting. You have to be a little bit careful about what you say about what you're predicting and what you're trying to get at. We are really good at long-term trends in climate. We understand that you know, the greenhouse gases are raising you know, global temperatures, and we can see that. Some of the, you know, there's other aspects of that that we, you know, that, that maybe that we can keep improving our prediction. I think one of the challenges, though, that you get to is taking that information and making it in, that's in a, using it in a way that's usable to people. So it's not enough to just generate the data. We also have to think about how do people use it? What are the questions they ask? And how do we ensure that they have the right information and know how to use it? And so when you look at things like climate model predictions, you kind of you have to under or projections, you have to understand what you're looking at in order to, to know, you know, how to use the different things. And I think one of the big things we're doing is trying to think about how people use that information and how can we make it easier. Come on. Okay. Uh, there was not a, a word mentioned about causes of the problems that we're facing in terms of pollution and everything. And I understand the science and what you're doing is very good. But somewhere there's got to be a practical application. And the powers that be don't seem to be phased by all the research you're doing. They just go ahead and keep <laughs> driving us into hotter weather, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to tell you, you know, what's going on. So I'm just curious, is there any connection between NASA and practical politics, so to speak? Yeah, so our role is really on the, you know, the science and technology side. So understanding what's happening, um, understanding what might happen, but then also a big part of our role is communicating it. Um, and so making people, making sure people understand what we know about climate change, what's driving it, what the impacts are. And so we do spend a lot of time thinking about how to communicate that, whether it's to other government agencies, international partners, the public. Um, but that's been our focus is trying to explain um, the science and make sure that that's accessible. And we're doing that in a number of different ways because people get information in different ways. And so everything from social media to lectures like this, um, depending on the audience, we're trying to bring the information we have so they understand, like, like you said, not just climate is changing, but also what are those drivers and what do we know about that? What can we do about the drivers? Yeah, so, maybe that's beyond your 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 uh, you know, your portfolio. But uh, I would like to see, uh, for instance, Gov uh, President Biden, believe it or not, has leased more dr drilling for oil and gas in federal lands than even Donald Trump. That startled me. But you know, that's the way the world's going, and that's going to come. <laughs> you can measure the results, I guess. And if you feed back enough, maybe people will start to do a little more clamoring. Okay, that's the end of it. Perhaps there will be a feedback loop. I want to ask you one of the questions uh, from online. Uh, it says, thank you for the great talk. This is Julian Broussard. About the work in aeronautics, do you fear that having slightly better planes will make people fly more and keep increasing flight-related emissions? More generally, some projects, such as collecting data on the moon, must be very costly, both in terms of emissions and money. How do you decide which projects are helpful and when they're worth being conducted based on their pros and cons? No, that's a great question. Um, so on the aeronautics, you know, I think what we're focused on is, you know, people are flying and, you know, how can we ensure that that's as environmental, you know, as reduce the environmental impact of that. And so again, a lot of that focus of the work I was talking about was on reducing energy use and emissions, which are something that the average person may not even see, but it's happening behind the scenes and it does have a benefit. But um, when you reduce those emissions, you'll see it in that your plane looks different. Um, but trying to make sure that as you know, if people are flying, that we're doing it as an environmentally friendly as we can. Um, in terms of your broader question, you mentioned the, the moon, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do this in general, because I think, you know, 
um, we have a process for how we identify what the priorities are in our different science areas. Um, and it's through the National Academies of Sciences and they do, they do what's called a decadal survey. So every 10 years we ask the science community, what are your most pressing science questions and how can we help answer them? And through that process, we're getting community input. So it's not just what I'm interested in, it's not just what another scientist is interested in. It's what is the general community interested in. And then we use those priorities to, um, to, to identify, to lay out our plan for the next 10 years in terms of science missions um, and how we're thinking about that. There are budget constraints that we have to work within um, and those come um, from the places that budget constraints come from. And so we do have to manage that and that does sometimes influence the science we can do, but we try to make sure that when we're choosing the science that we actually you know, get broad input into what are the important questions. Me? All right. I have a question about modeling as it relates to tipping points. Uh, so for example, like fresh water from Greenland disrupting like the oceanic currents and all that. So, I mean, given all the data, comes from pre the tipping point, what can our models tell us or what can we do to improve the models to tell us anything about what to expect after the current's been disrupted or after whatever the tipping point is? Yeah, and there's some efforts on this. This is not my specific area of research, so I'm gonna not give you a complete answer, but I'll give you the parts I know. So there are some ongoing efforts to think about this. Um, and they, you know, some of what I've seen is se separating the problem into different parts. And so there's some things where like, you know, we can't necessarily assess the likelihood of this one thing happening, but we can look at the effects if it did. Um, and so there are some efforts in the modeling community around that, like if this happened, what would be the impacts? That's different of whether it would happen. Um, there is also, I think, an ongoing effort to look more at tipping points in models. This is something I'm not directly involved in, so I don't know. But I think one of the big things on tipping points is just, we have a, a sort of a, a language thing that I think we also as scientists have to work through that what the average person interprets as a tipping point is not how a scientist defines it. And I think that does also cause quite a bit of confusion, at least in the, the general uh, media. I often get asked about tipping points with respect to 2023 being the hottest year on the record, but that's not a tipping point. That's a, a trend um, that will continue as greenhouse gas emissions um, continue. Um, and so I think that that's one of the things I do think we need to think about is what do we mean by tipping points? What do we actually need to know? And then we can work backwards to structure something. But there is an ongoing um, or, or a model inner comparison that, that I'm understanding is going to start around this, but I don't have enough information on that to share. Thank you. Could you talk about NASA's AI strategy, particularly using satellite data for climate science? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a lot of uses of AI going back a long time. Um, and you know everything from sort of how you operate things uh, like spacecraft or rovers to how you analyze data. And I think this is gonna be a really important part going forward um, because we are collecting more and more data from these new satellites. So the new satellites have much more data than old ones. A human person or human being can't look at every single thing. So some of the examples, I'll give you a couple of examples of AI applications in earth science um, using observations. So we had a team of researchers that counted trees in the Sahel using machine learning. So they essentially wanted to understand if we were underestimating the amount of carbon in, in a pretty dry region. Um, so they trained the computer to identify what a tree was and then fed it with a satellite record um, and had it count all of those trees. We've also been doing work on things like, you know, when you're just doing data processing, one of the things for some of these satellite um, records, you wanna take the clouds out because the cloud is not an observation of the thing you're looking at, it's a cloud. Um, and so they've been using AI to help do that. So that's sort of the pre-processing of data, you can remove the clouds using AI. And then we're also doing it for sort of automated image processing and detection. So there's an example now where they're using it to sort of identify where there are wildfire smoke plumes. Um, and so we, can we look at those without having to have a person look at each image as it comes in? Instead, can we have the you know, AI and machine learning help us identify what's in it? So look for particular features or anomalies um, that we need to look at more carefully um, or use for data sets. And I will also say, you mentioned, you asked about observations. We're also using a lot of AI in, in modeling, sort of thinking about parameterization and other things. Thank you, super informative presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, with the International Space Station being decommissioned in 2030 and 
NASA focusing more with Artemis on Moon and Mars. Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm understanding that the next um, sort of low Earth orbit commercial destination will be more of a public-private partnership model of PPP model. With the carrot of funding receding, how do you and NASA and the government um, strategize on the U.S. still maintaining a leadership in low Earth orbit and research um, destinations when it's a PPP model? Thank you. Yeah, no, it's an important question. It's something we think about a lot because in International Space Station, first of all, there's a bunch of Earth observing instruments on it that we're getting. And it's a slightly different way of doing it than a free flying satellite that has a lot of benefits. And so how do we, you know, what how do we think about those Earth observations? We're also, you know, there's a lot of science done by astronauts on the International Space Station. I mentioned crops. Um, there's also a lot of medical research. Um, there's also combustion research because um, it, you know, there's a lot of things that are different when you have gravity than when you don't. And so if you take away the gravity, you can improve processes by better understanding them. So there's a lot of that research going on. The idea is when the um, International Space Station retires at the end of the decade that we would use sort of by more of a service model where we say we want to do this experiment or we want this instrument and we have that on a commercial destination. Um, I think there, you know, some of the details of that are still going to unfold over time, particularly given, you know, what does that take to do? Who are the other partners that are involved in that? But the idea is that we would think about what are the science needs that we have and then, you know, go to a company to, uh, um, to, to help supply that science. Thank you very much. This is a great talk. And uh, NASA is big, PCC is also big. I probably you know, already know um, NASA CDAC uh, support host the IPCC DDC here at CSIN, uh, Economy University Global uh, uh, Climate School. Um, I, I wonder, given your leadership of IPCC, what's your, uh, for AR7, what's your vision? How uh, how to make the uh, NASA and also ESA, European uh, space uh, agencies, uh, EU data more accessible to globally. And the APCC and especially DDC face this problem, this issue to um, in previous uh, cycles. So you probably already know in the six uh, uh, panel meeting, 60th panel meeting and uh, people raised this question. Uh, what's your vision to make those data more available? Yeah, uh, so there were a lot of different parts to your question. I'm going to take them in, in sort of in a deconstructed way. Um, so first, just in general, our goal in us is to try to make data more accessible. Um, so some of that is, you know, focusing on the tools that take the the, the raw data to the, the 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 variable and the decision point that people are actually interested in. So helping with that processing. Some of it is making things more open. Um, so putting out not just our data products, but also the tools and um, and and models and, and resources that we use to process information. We're moving more data into the cloud. Um, we are putting out more trainings, including some in Spanish language, so that the data is more accessible in general. So that's from a sort of general NASA standpoint. Um, from an IPCC standpoint and thinking about IPCC and, and satellite data and NASA and ESA, you know, a lot of those satellite observations and the science that is done with those does get incorporated, particularly in the, the parts of the IPCC that are focused on the physical science and on the impacts. But there's a lot of information in there, particularly in some of these new satellites and observations that have, you know, that go beyond that. So they can look at things like emissions or, you know, you can get emissions related information from the observations we have of greenhouse gases. There's a paper I saw where someone was taking the night lights data to look at energy access. And so as we're able to use the satellite information to help do new science, you know, the IPCC's mandate is to assess all of the climate science. And so that I think can also get incorporated in. And then just bringing those two things together, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there was actually during the previous IPCC assessment cycle, there was a joint effort by NASA and Working Group One to put out sea level rise data. So all of the sea level projections that were incorporated in the IPCC's report last time are on a NASA website. And it was part of this larger effort we had at NASA to actually think about how to get sea level rise information to coastal communities. So they had spent a lot of time thinking about what is that information? They had developed a portal where you could look at historic sea level data 
data. And so then they incorporated the, the IPCC projections in there and it was released alongside the IPCC report. And so there are examples of that where NASA and IPCC work together to get data more accessible. And I think there's a few things that we're thinking about now, but I think you know where that goes, it's a little too early in the IPCC process to know. Um, but there are examples there. And I think from an IPCC standpoint, getting data to people is also really important. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.